Welcome back to another episode of the House Husband Diaries. As always, past, present, and hopefully future, I am your host, Carter C. Got my buddy Chase back at it. And uh, let's see. Today, well, before I say what we're going to do today, so as you know, with the revamp of the channel, uh, me talking a lot about the human condition with different guests, and then uh, looking at um, history, uh, religion, politics, especially as it relates to today, but we're just trying to get a foundational um, uh, understanding so that we know where we're having this conversation. But today, Chase and I thought we would um, have a little fun and talk about our experiences in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, I think we mentioned in the last episode that Chase was on uh, that uh, we Shortly after we met, we got to go to Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, so I think we'll just kind of talk kind of how Haiti impacted us personally, uh, as well as our friendship and kind of going and, and doing something, a uh, big trip to get you out of your comfort zone and, and how that uh, plays a part in sort of uh, our lives, the human condition sort of. And we won't maybe get too deep. Maybe we will. We'll see. I don't know. What do you think? We'll see how the conversation flows. <clears throat> how it flow. Uh, so yeah, so as I said, I'm uh, probably a year or so ago, um, I think I did a, a video on, on my trips to Haiti, but when the earthquake happened in, in Haiti in 2010, about six months later, I had a buddy of mine who was, who was flying down and he asked me and another one of his friends that I didn't know to, to go down to Haiti. So we flew down to the Dominican Republic and rented a car and drove across the border. And that was a whole wild experience in and of itself. We didn't uh, download maps, we didn't have a map. And so he was just going by his memory of having done it a few months prior, which wasn't the best memory. And uh, so we got lost in Dominican Republic on the way to the border. And then we got stopped by the border, and uh, I did do this a, a video on this because I talked about all the corruption that I saw at the border and how we had to pay a bribe uh, after an entire day of not being able to cross the border with all of our paperwork and everything. It was just a really interesting experience. But um, while I was there, you know, there was so much destruction. And six months after this earthquake, and it was still just rubble, buildings everywhere were just... Uh, still piles of rubble and and very little had been cleaned up in six months which I was really shocked about and um, and there were all these tent cities and, and places that we went and people that we met there just seemed to be so many needs for so many people and and they're just it just seemed so easy like such an easy place to get involved and to feel good about uh, helping out mm -hmm. and so I came back to, to the States after that couple weeks and that experience and just said, hey, you know, I need to get back. I had met some people that had some connections in Haiti and some Haitian people that, that were high up and, and had, were well connected in the country and they wanted us to come back and me to bring other people. And so uh, Chase, as we talked about, we had done this cookout and these, these, um, these things where we just got together and we had community. And it was super fun. We said, hey, you know, like maybe we can go down. I can introduce you to some people in Haiti and maybe we can find find out some areas where maybe we could we could plug in and, and kind of make a difference relatively consistently quickly. and consistently. And um, yeah, so we raised some money. And as I said, back when I was doing nonprofit work, so I had my own nonprofit that I had started years before. And uh yeah, I'll let you take it from there. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, it was interesting. So it was early November of 2011. So it was roughly a year and a half after the earthquake. And mm -hmm. so we fly down into, into Port-au-Prince, and, and this was my first international trip. So uh, I had never experienced poverty uh, on this kind of level before. And, and again, as Carter mentioned, it's the, the poorest country in, in this hemisphere. So you would expect there to be a, a drastic kind of culture shock. And uh, my mother had passed away just a couple of weeks before, so there's just a lot of emotion going on. 
but this was something that Carter and I had been kind of planning for for a number of months, and I had sent out support letters and, and everything, so I felt it was something that I really had to, to kind of see through, especially for my, my personal growth, to really open my mind to just what, what the world has to offer and, and to just see a different culture, to see their way of life, to see just how they see the world, and just to experience that. So we fly down and uh, through a, a connection of his, uh, I, I can't even remember his name at this point, but uh, a soccer, uh, a guy who's got connections in, in the soccer world. And so he, we had collected all this soccer equipment. And mm-hmm. so we had these two huge duffel bags. I think it was two, it may have even been more, but we had mm-hmm. we had a lot of soccer equipment that we were gonna take down and, and just, we, we figured we'd find somebody, we'd get connected with somebody who could could use that equipment. And so we've got all this gear, and, and so we're just, we've got these shopping carts, and I just very uh, fondly remember going through the airport, and then all these different people are coming at you, and, and they, they mean well, they, they want to help you, but obviously they want you to, to give them money for, for helping them out and everything, so there's just all of a sudden this culture shock, and whoa, what's happening, are they going to try to steal my bags and all that, so it's just a lot of different things going on through your mind for your, for my first international do, trip. Do you remember, that you're now bringing something up I hadn't thought about in a long time, <clears throat> so well, on my first trip to, to Haiti, uh, we had the, the um, privilege of meeting uh, someone who would in the future become the first lady of, of Haiti. And, uh, and so I got to meet her and, and have dinner or have lunch at their house. And, and, um, uh, you know, I never met the, the future president. He was out doing something that day, but anyway, they, they had some relief stuff for the people in Haiti. And so through them, um, well, through another connection, we met her and then through these other people, um, they were something they had been high up in the airports and so when we flew in directly to port au prince so the first time i had flown into the dominican republic and drove and this was the first time i'd ever flown directly in into haiti and um the only time actually i've ever done that but um when we landed i told chase i don't really know what's going to happen i've never done this before and there was somebody that had the had our, our name mm-hmm. on on their you know it was like the limousine drivers or whatever and they were like hey and they were like okay yeah perfect uh, that's us. And then they just took our passports and like, we went around everybody. They're like, we got first class. It was like, we were, it was like, we came in on a private jet or something. And I, I was like, don't get used to this. Cause this is not, this, this is, is not normal. Yeah. This is not normal. I don't get treated this way in my own, uh, hometown, much less, um, in, in any of my international travels. So that was quite a fun experience. I think for one, I know it was one for me, but that was for your first international experience to, to be whisked away and not have yeah. to wait in any lines and be treated like a VIP it had to be, oh. it had to be, a, it had to be really Carter, set the there's stage. something I don't know about it, you. It had, to be, it had to be, it had to be a strange letdown from your, for your next travel. Cause then you were like, wait a minute, I have to wait in line. Dang uh, it. Where's Carter at? I need yeah, a pocket Carter. Not me. <laughs> God, that was, that was so much fun. And then we so said, then we had this, um, like a, uh, we had a chauffeur and a, uh, uh, which is mainly just for our safety. Um, but then but then we also had like a guide that was going to be with us the, the entire week and a half or two weeks that we were down there. And uh, and so, you know, we meet her and, and, and the driver and everybody wanted to help. I remember like that was, a, it was like I a forgot storm. about that. And they were just, we pushed these things. They had all these soccer balls and all these uh, um, soccer uh, shoes and, and shirts and you know, jerseys and stuff. And it was so, so much and we're at our backpacks and in our bags and um, at camera equipment and um, yeah, that was wild. Just that experience alone, it's like, all right, we we can go back now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just show up, drop off some soccer equipment. We are such good people. Yeah, it Maybe. was it was such a such a fascinating experience again for my first international trip and and then just the collective of that to kind of be my first kind of in your face. Oh, this is what international travel is like. Uh, and then subsequent trips are like, oh, it's kind of like that, but not every time, especially when you go to to more uh, first world countries. Um, I was gonna say, but you know, you've been you've been to Africa several times. You've been to a number of European countries, Southeast um, Asian countries, Southeast Asian, and and then obviously around the U.S. Um, have have you ever experienced? I just thought of this because it was similar in India. It was kind of weird. 
Um, it's similar um, in, in other places where people are are all in your face trying to mm-hmm. get your stuff. But I don't, I, I don't remember having that feeling in, in Europe or anywhere in the, in, in the U Africa. S Africa is very, very similar that I say Africa, Uganda is the, the country that I've been there and, and it's very similar. I don't remember there, there being maybe that many people that were, that were swarming. Yeah. There were, there were a number of people out there obviously, but and then again, every time that, that I've landed in, in Uganda, it's been usually night. And so oh, okay. a lot of people have, have kind of gone gone home. And same thing, we have a particular, there's a driver and a van. And You've already there's, had it set up. I, I've been there before, and, and usually there's like a trip leader that knows, all right, I know where we're going in the airport. I know, all right, everybody, here's your $100 for the customs fee or whatever. And <laughs> so, you know, yeah, exactly, customs, customs fee. fee. So, uh <laughs> It, 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 that was a different experience. Here's your hundred dollars for voting. For and Joe I don't Biden. know if that's. I haven't been to a lot of other countries similar to Haiti, other than I would say Uganda. Yeah. Uh, even in my Southeast Asian experiences, uh, going to Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam, it just it wasn't there. There wasn't a swarm. I mean, sure, again, there were people. It's there. It's more taxis are trying to swarm you they're trying yeah, that's to, what i'm saying yeah i just don't know that there i mean maybe maybe it is maybe there are uh things like that or maybe people that don't speak english very well that come to america and they they show up in new york or mm-hmm. la or something and they walk out maybe they do feel um bombarded yeah bombarded or inundated by all of this this stuff because it's they're not used to it so they're not mm-hmm. used to the number of taxis or yeah. the number or what they look like they're you know maybe so maybe maybe there's just a cultural thing but i, I hadn't really thought about that it, it was all it was a I, it is an uncomfortable feeling to have a whole bunch of people speaking a language you don't know mm-hmm. uh trying to you know and not, not that they're doing anything wrong you know or mean or ill will they're just they want they want to help but but you especially having traveled solo a number of times yeah. to to these countries uh, like in Cambodia, Myanmar, and that kind of thing, it, you have this thought process of they probably mean well, but there's always that one person that that it takes to, to ruin your day. Mm-hmm. And so you're always a little bit more on edge, uh, keeping your valuables closer to you and stuff like that. You're like, no, nah, I, I can do it. I'll, I'll, it's, it's great that you want to help, exactly. but... Like I can do it myself, and I'm an independent person anyway, so I don't really, I don't really want people to help me out, at least in certain regards. So, it's one of those, it's a, it's a weird headspace to be in. It's like, all right, well, I want to help you, but on this, on the flip side, they just see American or, or they see white people, and they're like, oh, they have money, and they're just gonna give it to me. And yeah. so there's that, and this is one of the big things that I learned is, uh, while we were in Haiti, is it, it, it really anybody who's read the book when helping hurts you get into this well i want to help but giving you money doesn't help you and yeah. that was and i don't want to get too far ahead but uh yeah we'll come back to that in a minute as far <laughs> as like seeing the the nonprofits that have been there and, and creating the uh the dependency on yeah. on foreign foreign funds and yeah so we'll, we'll definitely get to that so what was your so so we we we, we, we get, landed yeah so we, we get we get into to the the jeep um, that was taking us around, and uh, and then we just we we travel. So what, did they take us straight to where we were staying? Is that yeah, I remember we went from uh, Port-au-Prince up to Patientville, and I th- yep. think I don't think Melissa was with us at that. Maybe she was. No, she met us what was the, the driver's name? I can't remember. Anyways, uh, I remember. he he didn't speak any English. He he spent uh, or spoke uh, Haitian Creole mm-hmm. or French Creole, and uh, then Melissa who. We later found out was the daughter of the former general, General Abraham, when when Haiti had an army. Uh, so there was the the. But you um, also know he was a former president. Well, that's Haiti. what I was about to say. Is he yeah. during during the revolution, during the coup, uh, when the military Duvalier. Duvalier uh, so yeah. he he was the interim president for three days while they they uh, yeah. democratically elected uh, a president. So. Something just, we can say, you have met a former president of a country, and he liked you because your name was Carter. He's like, oh, Jimmy Carter. I know Jimmy Carter. <laughs> uh, but it was it was definitely an interesting experience to spend roughly two weeks with uh, the daughter of her former general, and, and she was super petite, uh, little I lady. That, and, I shared that in, in that in that story about Haiti. I talked about it, and, and I told that story about uh, the Jimmy Carter thing because uh, I told him my name. 
And I said, oh, I'm Carter. And he goes, Carter. And I go, like, Jimmy Carter. He goes, oh, you know Jimmy. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I don't know Jimmy Carter. Just, I am not that connected. And he goes, oh, Jimmy is a very good friend. He's very good. Yeah. You know, and then I, that was before I knew that he had been, a, you know, the president and helped overthrow Duvalier. And then, and then he's the only person in Haiti, in the 20th century in Haiti, to voluntarily give up the presidency, mm-hmm. which I thought was fascinating after, obviously, after I left. Um, but he was an itty bitty little guy and not somebody that, you know, so I, I also told the story that when we were driving around and, uh, Melissa was like, uh, you know, don't, I said something about, oh, well, do we have like a gun or something? Cause I'd been driven around the, the previous trip with, in a car that had bulletproof windows and they were like, you know, don't worry if, if a mob just happens to come up, which happens from time to time and there's, everybody's wielding machetes and stuff. Um, you know, we, we've got protection and we've got bulletproof windows and stuff. So I was like, Melissa, you know, what's the situation? She's like, nobody will mess with us. And I was like, I mean, that's nice, but you're like 5'2". Or maybe 5 feet tall. <laughs> I think she's just 5'1". Yeah. Like yeah, I don't know. She's stretching she's, it. She's itty bitty. And uh, and so I was like, I don't know that I would be that like uh, confident. And she was like, no, 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 they won't mess with us. And I was like, why? And she was like, or why are you so confident? And she was like, because my father is the general. And I was like, oh, so he must be like 6'5". You know, beefcake, and he was he was not, but he is a really nice guy, and uh, yeah, whenever we went to his office, it was only a couple times throughout the couple weeks, I said, you know, we would pull in, had a gate, and had armed guards everywhere, and that was just mm-hmm. a really fascinating experience if you've never lived in a place uh, that needs armed guards wherever you go, like the all the houses, all the nice places, all the business places of business, restaurants. Yeah, it's just such a weird. Well, that was my first experience is I think we, we went and dropped our stuff off and, and then we came and went to this little restaurant, the little cafe. and Well, if we in. dropped it off at the house, they had armed guards at the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember the guy, they were watching TV and they had the shotgun just hanging up yeah, just right against the TV. Go. Uh, but, but we go to this restaurant and you pull in and, of course, there's a gate that opens up. Guy standing there with a shotgun. You pull in and it's like this beautiful jungle oasis in the middle of Haiti. And there's just guys with shotguns just kind of walking around. And what was uh, also was interesting is the the way that they have their their walls up there is that as they're laying oh, the yeah. concrete, they they shatter glass and they stuff that into the concrete. And as it dries, now you've got kind of a little uh, barrier, so you, you don't have guys that are trying to jump up over the the walls. And I'm here, my naive twenty whatever age self is, and I'm whoa. I am not in the. I'm not in Kansas anymore, <laughs> Toto. <laughs> yeah. What if you have to? Yeah. You know, what if? What if? What if people break in to your compound and you've got to get out? You can't jump over yeah. the wall. It's like a. No. Yeah. It's a deterrent too yeah. to get. Oh man. Did, were you? Was it? Was it our trip? Where the guys told us about the um, the the guy was caught stealing and he tried to leave. And yeah, run, I think and he so. Tried to and he, climb over the wall, and they shot him. And, and he just he, and he just got hung on so, the shards of glass. And I so, think that was the fire like, guy, well, firefighters. It, it was, and they had to go, and they couldn't go get him off the wall because he was stuck on the walls. He's yeah. just dead, and it's a hundred degrees in Haiti. And he's just and the, cooking. Oh, we were like, is this real life? Like they, they just shoot him, <laughs> and so this ambulance, the firefighters aren't very well funded, and their car battery, the ambulance battery, had died. And they were like, can you get us a car battery from America so that we can go get dead mm-hmm. people off walls that have tried to, that have gotten shot and killed trying to rob people's house? It's the wild. Wild West. Wild, wild West. Um, yeah, and then they said they had a boat. And I was like, well, did they take the battery off the boat? Because there's usually like a car battery on a mm-hmm. boat and they could put it in there. And they're like, oh, we'll have to ask them. That was all different. That was cool. Uh, Sorry. It was, well, it's just interesting. Speaking of shattered glass and walls and dead (laughs) people. It was interesting meeting. So we met some firefighters that had been trained up in Virginia and had come back down. And and the sad part of that was they had a lot of training, a lot of formal training. But the infrastructure, and this was, I would say, a reoccurring theme throughout the whole trip, was regardless of what we were trying to do and and all the, the stuff that we learned was, Haiti doesn't have infrastructure, mm-hmm. and after the dictator was overthrown, doesn't have very very good infrastructure. Well, it, it has infrastructure, but I say as infrastructure as we would understand it, right. as far as roads that are accessible and yeah. equipment to where 
you go to your truck and, and it, it starts. And if you don't have that truck, you just jump into another one. So you have so many stories where they get a call, these firefighters that are, are trained, yeah. but their equipment just isn't sufficient. And so they go out, they're on their way to, to whatever situation they've been called to. And then there's just a, a, a gridlock traffic jam. I'm like, all right, well, so-and-so died because we can't get out of this gridlock or same thing. It's like, well, our battery doesn't work. So sorry, we can't get to you for the fire or medical situation or whatever. So it was just unfortunate because there's a lot of good that can be done down there, but the infrastructure just doesn't support it. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think before we get into that, I mean, do you remember the, the like, Hop on, hop, hop off taxis. Uh, people, with the tuk tuks. Yeah, uh, is that in India? Tap, or is that... tap taps. I think they were tap taps. I don't. Yeah, something. And uh, they were like, I get my India and my Haiti. Yeah, yeah. With, Those are rickshaws. I don't know. That's in Southeast Asia too. But yeah, it was like they they would just jump on, and there's people hanging off of these taxis, but they're trucks. They're like Datsuns and ne- little, and, little and, small little yeah. Nissans, and and they're just hanging on. And then people, I was like, how, did, how are they making money? Like, nobody's paying. They just run and jump on and hold mm-hmm. onto a bar and a footstool, and then they just ride a couple blocks, and they just hop off. And they're like, yeah, thanks. I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I couldn't figure out Haiti's economy to save my life. Well. more Later. That the, comes later. The, the, the down, <laughs> the, 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 the hill economics, I, I can, uh, I couldn't really figure out. But the, uh, the yeah, the, the amount of aid that we that we give Haiti and where it goes, I could definitely figure out because when we pulled up where we were staying was a wealthy uh, guy's second home on his same. I mean, he had the same property, but it was like a guest house on his property. And it was, you got the, uh, we each had, you got the, you got the master bedroom though. Yeah. And it was ginormous, but then you didn't have hot water, right? I don't think I had, so I'd have to come to your shower <laughs> to get hot water. <laughs> and then there was, so I think it was three bedrooms, right? And then I his son two stayed story. in the, the the downstairs bedroom, and I don't and know. then you and I had the upstairs bedroom. Did he bedrooms. stay in the same house? I'm pretty sure, because it I was at one night. in the main house. I just think he just walked over from the main house. Maybe. I thought that was like I don't know. completely our house, and it had a pool. The guest house had a pool. Yeah. It had and a downstairs then, apartment, because that's where the... the lady servant that would serve us breakfast, breakfast salads with spam, with cook spam of oh. the morning. <laughs> That's another oh. thing about that whole trip was you just, well, we don't want breakfast. So maybe if we just wake up earlier, she won't be here and we can just yeah. slide out. Yeah. No, she was there early and, and she's like, Oh, here's we've cooked you breakfast. And we're like, Oh, thank you. Mm, yeah. Don't really want spam, and, but and oh, spam. salad for breakfast with spam. Yeah. That was good. Mm, yeah. It kept us going. Uh, so yeah, let's let's kind of progress through. So we stayed at this this house, and and uh, it was that was interesting in and of itself to to have this huge house and two rooms that were kind of far apart, and uh, just where it was. There was a guard at, at that place as well, and yeah, uh, there was a servant that would come and cook us uh, breakfast and and everything. And not that we had requested that, but that was just. Ha- the girl showed up and yeah. here's food on the table. Yeah, that was so weird. It's it's it, yeah, it was like you know, just the amount the amount of things that some of those Haitians had, I just wasn't expecting because yeah. you always hear it's the poorest country in the western hemisphere and you know, those people need help and so for as Americans, as first world, you know, whatever people, I don't know what you would, you know, we were just happen to be born in America. That doesn't really make us any different. And but we should help. And here's a country, a group of people that need help. And then you go down there, and a lot of these people have more money than we do. Mm-hmm. Way more money. Way much more. Well, I think that was the experience with uh, Carl. So Carl Senior was the. Don't name drop everybody. <laughs> God, <Sorry>. jeez. <laughs> you can cut that out. No. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Post edit. So there, there was a, a father and a the son. owner. The owner of Hardee's, Carl Jr. <laughs> I don't eat Hardee's. Uh, 
so the the folks that he met previous, we ended up hanging out with his son uh, for a little bit, and he's talking about all these different, you know, I've got this vehicle and all this stuff, and it's just interesting that you're talking about this wealth, and, and there's just this, this divide of, of wealth, and there's not really a middle class that, that exists in Haiti, and that was interesting to learn. Uh, again, I didn't know much about the country before we went down there. I didn't do a whole lot of research, and it was just a, I'm going to go learn. And yeah. so from my perspective, I was very open-minded and mm-hmm. just kind of taking in the whole experience. And it was, I don't want to say it was too much to process, but in a short amount of time, there was just so much to take in. And so even still today, I, I process through some of that. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, that's why we're finally talking about it now. Like, it's, you know, we've talked about it a little over, over the years. But I, I think, I mean, it, it, there's not really a way to reconcile that amount of wealth and that amount of, of poverty mm-hmm. in such a small country. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any, any sense. I mean, yeah. it, it makes sense when we talk about the human condition and the, and that greed and, and, and whether that's our natural state is to be greedy and, and, and want to control others. But when we look at, you know, the natural state of a lot of people to be selfless and and want equality and all that kind of stuff, it it really is hard to compute and, and try to figure out why there's that large a disparity in a country that, you know, for the last hundred plus years hasn't really produced anything. Mm Mm-hmm. And so how are there such rich people in a country that doesn't really have an economy? A and beautiful country that does have a tourist outlet, but it, again, it's like you said, it's not really producing uh, a large amount of exports or there's not a, a huge manufacturing presence or, or anything on the global scale. There's there. not even a huge tourism industry yeah, because, sure. because it's such a politically unstable country mm-hmm. that they can't really... Uh, well, people don't wake up and say, I want to go to Haiti. <laughs> Not that I know of. Because, because of that, though. No. Nobody does. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Where should we go? Let's go to Haiti. Hmm, sweetie. <laughs> you know, I was thinking. Yeah. Tahiti, Bora Bora, <laughs> Haiti. No. Maybe the first two. Yeah. Where do you want to go on spring break? Let's go to Haiti. Yeah. It was a, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that, things that you don't even think about in America. So we'd be driving down the road and you would see uh, like a paved road in the middle of the city, the capital city, and there would be on the curb, there would be uh, tied up chickens, just, just tied up so they can't run, their feet are tied together and they're just lying on the curb, just tied up, and some lady, there's only like five of them, some lady just mm-hmm. selling them, and they're like panting, the chickens. I know this is like not a PETA, again, I'm just... PETA friendly. Not a PETA friendly, you know. PETA, go down to Haiti. Get away from them. Stop bothering me in America. <laughs> there, there are plenty of chickens you can save down in Haiti. But it's like, it's wild, you know. It's like, what, what are they doing with those chickens? I'm like, they're selling them. They're just here. It was like, there's no sign. There's no nothing. They're just... It's a, it's five, just, you know, just five, just know. yeah, just five tied up chickens. You want a chicken? No. Well, I think that that, that same random kind of ideology or, or experience was when we were driving through some of those mountain towns, and uh, I don't know if you remember, like the uh, Digicel, I think was the cell phone company that had, so. had come in, and they said, you know, we'll we'll come in and we'll pave the roads in certain cities, and oh yeah, uh, the the road names. They had these little this little globe on top that had Digicel on every single uh, uh, road sign, and as we were driving through these little mountain towns, you'd see this umbrella that had Digicel, and then it was a little store just up in the middle of nowhere, and they were you could tell that they were selling cell phones or cell phone minutes or whatever, yeah. and it's just in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we are so far from any kind of what we would consider civilization, and here's this lady on the top of a mountain on the side of the street. Selling cell phone minutes. and yeah. What do you need a cell phone for? You need to feed your family or feed yourself. Yeah. And, and so that was a whole other kind of thought process uh, or, or processing of what I'm experiencing is how pervasive first world country 
uh, life can go. And, and we use the word kind of corrupt uh, other countries that are not, they're, they're undeveloped or developing, if you will. Yeah, it's interesting. And that goes back to kind of the idea of where does, you know, technology come into play for for humanity and for what we're doing. Because, yeah, I mean, people in, in very rural, very poor places don't need cell phones. And they don't need to spend any percentage of their meager income mm -hmm. on cell phones. It just doesn't make any sense. And it's there. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's a, it's a very backwards... Um, uh, I don't. I don't even know what you would call that. I mean, just a um, lifestyle. Yeah, but it's not. It's not their civilization yeah. or lifestyle. It's just a. It's a. It's a backward sort of. Um, I guess economy. Yeah. You know, it's not really people are like. Do do people really need those technological items, or do they need? Is that a necessity yeah, of, more of survival or, or whatever, a luxury? Yeah, yeah it's you know, so weird. weird. Yeah, when you get to that point. And we don't really have to think about that much in, a, in, in, in the United States because for a, lot of, for a lot of people that have more resources, it's just, you know, I mean, heck, we're doing this video on a laptop that's going to be uploaded onto YouTube and, you know, people mm -hmm. will watch it and whatever. And that's just a whole different ball game. We're not worried about where the next meal is coming from or you know, recovering from an earthquake and all that kind of stuff is, is very different. Or having an armed security guard outside of our house. I don't know. I mean, it could be cool. Say, you know, Steve out there, he's a nice fella, but don't don't make him mad. Well, once, uh, yeah, once once we get into politics, we might need an armed <laughs> guard out there. Woo! So do you want to talk about kind of our general purpose being down there and that kind of led us to... If you want to, I mean, you know, you can talk about sure some of that stuff. Uh, so our, I think our... This is your world. It is? And I'm just living it. The world revolves around me? It does. Oh, it okay. Does. Yeah. We may be on the House Husband Diaries channel, but this is your world. Can I have it my way? <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I get some bacon on that? If you want it. Maybe some fried onions? So the, the goal that we had when we went down there uh, was to come up with some emergency pre preparedness plans for some orphanages. And I'll let you kind of go into when you met uh, uh, met them on your previous trip, uh, the, the nonprofit. They had orphanages that they were giving out resources. And so that was where Melissa came into play. She had not seen some of those orphanages that they were kind of distributing some funds to. And uh, so we... We saw the spectrum of, of uh, resources, or, or not even resources, but the spectrum of... Uh, we got introduced to an orphanage that I think there were two or three guys that had nine little boys that had been affected by the earthquake. And they clothed them, they fed them, they, were, they really wanted to give them a, a good, solid education. And they had really good hearts, and they wanted to do more, but they realized that there was a balance of we could take more children in, but at the the expense of, well, then we would have to, to spread thin the food, the resources, the clothes, and everything else. And so that, that was really one of their requests was, hey, can we get more resources uh, to help more kids? Uh, and so we saw that end of the spectrum where it was, I would say that they were doing it the right way. And then we saw the other end of the, of the spectrum where there was this one orphanage that was living pretty much day to day on on whatever foreign aid that was coming in and there was roughly a thousand uh, orphans that they had kind of under one building and they didn't really have enough money for any kind of sustainable food storage or anything like that and down in the in kind of the basement of that building which was mostly concrete they had uh, the room sectioned off by basically just cardboard or not cardboard but uh, plywood uh, partitions and they had everywhere from from little toddlers all the way up to to uh, the higher grades of high school and they were all being taught in in the same room and so the quality of, of education was just not there and you could just tell that that was kind of a cash cow situation and so for for me that was really kind of eye-opening in that there's and Haiti is I don't want to say it's a special situation but there's so much information out there as far as the Clinton Foundation and, and bringing in all this money 
and it never actually making it down to the those that, that are in need. So we saw that kind of situation where the the manager or the, the CEO of that orphanage comes up in a, not a news vehicle, but it was clearly clean and, and nice, and he's got a, a bigger belly and everything, and, and you could tell that those kids were kind of taken care of, but they really weren't. They weren't getting a quality education, and then we, we went to a few other orphanages where they were much smaller, and you could tell that they, they tried to have a ratio of adults to children that, that the, the, the children were really taken care of. And so that was really interesting to see that, man, there's so many people that want to help, but there, there's not the, the help isn't really getting to the kids. And us being there, like you said earlier, it was just, it was blatantly obvious that there's so many different ways that we can get plugged in here. And it's almost just like, let's, let's pick this one. I mean, you don't even have to really look. It's like, okay, well, let's let's choose this. Um, I don't know what your thoughts on that were, but that was that was one of the big takeaways that I had. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the big biggest takeaway I had was was that if I wasn't going to move there and invest my entire life in and helping that group of people, then I I really shouldn't be mm-hmm. down there anyway. And and I say that because on my first trip down and, and met, um, who would eventually be the, the first lady of Haiti. She, um, was talking about how she couldn't, with all of her contacts, she couldn't get, there was a, a shipping container full of stuff to give to people in 10 cities. And, uh, even she couldn't with all of her connections, get that, that shipping container out of the port and the port, the head of the port authority or whatever, whoever was in charge of that stuff wanted a bribe and had full control of anything that any nonprofit was sending down to Haiti. And so for all of the shoe boxes and the Christmas things and everything everybody's doing, a lot of that stuff never gets where you think it's going. So you, you, you put all this stuff and it may just sit in a, in a shipping container in, in Haiti for indefinitely, indefinitely for however long. And if, if, if the nonprofits never pay that bribe or if the, the, your contacts never pay that bribe or aren't on the inside of whatever that situation is, then, then that stuff just, just sits there. And that was so disheartening to me and eye-opening that I really can't, I really can't help long distance. And that's not to say don't go you know, don't go have the experience that I've had or go have the experiences that that Chase has had to other countries and and, and to do, I mean, yeah, if if you haven't seen it for your own eyes and you don't, you know, you're not really sure, go, go see it for yourself, you know, go have those experiences. But I think for me, it really just kind of came down to, um, you know, I can't really help the day to day because even if I start the down this road of trying to help provide food or uh, books or more things for those people, I'm not sure that that'll ever make it through. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so then I kind of started, um, started asking, I started asking how, how do I help? Like, how can I help or can I even help? And, and that became kind of a a bigger, uh, a, a bigger question that has stuck with me for the last decade or so I guess because I, I don't know that I can really do much international good uh, whereas in my 20s I thought I could because you're still in your 20s right in my no I never made it in my mind I never made it to my 20s and physically I'm way past my 20s so nope neither way mind and body I hear you I think it's just interesting because I kind of had a, have learned uh, similarly in, in traveling with a, another nonprofit to Uganda. Same, same, but different. It, it's exactly same, same, but different. If you travel to Southeast Asia, that's the phrase over there. Uh, traveling to Uganda three, three separate times. Uh, the, I would say the first time was again, new experience, new, new culture, new country. And then the subsequent two times of travel there it's familiarity. I've met some people and, and seeing old friends and, but it's it's the same thing as far as these nonprofits that are trying to help internationally, and there's so many people that mean very well, 
and and so many of us here in the states that you mean well you might not have the the capability of traveling to that country or staying there for months and, and actually physically helping so you do the what we think is the right thing we send our funds off uh, to, to a nonprofit overseas uh, are based here in the states and they've got a base overseas and it's just unfortunate you have to put your eyes on their operation and really get a sense of what they're they're really trying to do for me to, to trust that organization and and to give my money because there's so many stories out there and if you do any kind of Google research or, or uh, internet search you're gonna find there's so many scams that are out there and it's unfortunate mm-hmm. that kind of getting into the human condition th- that that is something that people do they they will take advantage of people's good nature and their good heart mm-hmm. uh, for their own gain so that was and, and that actually I think probably what solidified that for me well there, there were two instances uh, one was our guide when we were down there across from that restaurant that Chase mm-hmm. was talking about the the beautiful restaurant it was right in downtown somewhere um but across from from that restaurant was was a couple uh, or were several it's like a compound um, yeah were several compounds from four nonprofits, and so we saw a bunch of red cross and then there's like a was it an islamic red cross or something the red crescent yeah, something. or something i don't know and uh, but anyway there were a number of of, of compounds from uh, or, or that were that were um, inhabited by uh, these nonprofits, these big international nonprofits that people were giving a lot of money to, and and the Haitian guy that we had, you know, said, you know, this this is just one of the problems, but you can see it. Just look across the road, and he said, okay, like I don't remember which one it was, so I mean, no re- reason in calling any one of them in particularly out, but but they're like, you know, look at this compound. And, you know, this nonprofit has been here since the 1940s or the 1950s or 1960s. I don't know what, what she said, but it had been there for 50 or 60 years. And she said, you know, and, 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 and what has changed? Haiti is still the poorest country mm-hmm. in, in the Western Hemisphere. You know, look at all of the people, all of the poverty. But yet they have bigger walls. When they first came here, they didn't have a compound they just had a little hut or they had a little building and it didn't have any walls you know around it and now over the years they've been getting all of this money all of these you know big international nonprofits continue to say we're doing great work in Haiti we're doing great work in all these third world countries give us more money give us more money so they buy bigger plots of land they build bigger walls around their plantations and then very little of that people get paid American wages or, you know, European wages, $50,000, $80,000, who knows, $150,000 a year to go live and work in Haiti. Mm-hmm. And that money just never makes it out to to the, the streets, to the people. Yeah, to the streets. And so, uh, so, it, so, so that was like, that was one really powerful instance. And then the other one was sitting in that house, that wealthy guy in the guest house and uh, smoking uh, Cuban cigars. He offered him to us, and he says, "Oh, these are Cuban." Oh, well, I wasn't gonna smoke a cigar <laughs> unless it was Cuban. unless it was Cuban. Let's be honest, because uh, I'm from America, and you know we can't get Cuban cigars. Uh, I mean, we get limited numbers or whatever. But it was just it was so weird, and we were like, "Well, you know, what do you want to change?" And he was like, "Change? Why would I want anything to change? Look at me, mm-hmm. I'm doing wonderfully. I'm doing really well. I don't see a problem." You know, and you're like, yeah, smoke ring, smoke ring. I don't think he was that talented, but <laughs> anyway, maybe he did blow smoke rings. But it was, it was like, wow, that's really interesting. You know, like you've got, you've got the whole, the whole gamut among the elite in Haiti too. Some don't want Haiti to change because they're making tons of money and they're profiting off of all of that. And then you've got others that say, hey, look, here's the problem. You know, we'd like to see our country change and not be the butt of western hemisphere you know mm-hmm. trivia and you know so 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 where is that and at some point i feel like the the people that live there are the ones that have to have to make the change mm-hmm. not me not someone foreign, from outside yeah, yeah not, not foreign, foreign influence. Change. and i think yeah. that to me goes back to to when helping hurts is there's a difference between it's that whole idea of giving a man a fish versus teaching a man a fish and 
what's been happening, not just in Haiti, but in Africa and, and other countries, is we just go when we give. We give clothes, we give money, we give food, instead of coming alongside of people and, and ask them, hey, what, what, how can we help you raise the quality of your life? What do you, what do you genuinely need? So many times we go over and, oh, well, you need electricity. Well, you need this, you need this. And so we give that to them and then we leave and that tractor, because we didn't give them the parts to fix it if it broke, it breaks down. And then the next time we go over, why aren't you using that tractor? Well, it broke. Well, that's an interesting question though. I mean, like, do people, I mean, we've already butchered this, so there's no, there's no opportunity to, to go anywhere. I don't believe in the world. Maybe there are a few untouched tribes in like Papua New Guinea Mm -hmm. or, or the Amazon. But, but if if you were to go to an untouched people group in, in that's left somewhere, and you were to ask them, what do you need? If they've been living for a thousand years or 2000 years, Mm -hmm. they don't need anything. Yeah. Their answer would probably be, I think we're fine. I think that gets that that will be a tide in in future episodes. In what, well, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to make some really intelligent, <laughs> you know, subtle, amazing knowledge drop. What what yeah. makes it? Why do we feel that they need to change? Yeah, and that's that's a, a bigger issue. Why with, do we feel like that they're lacking something? Exactly, exactly. Well, that brings in religion, and and we're spreading the news of Jesus or whatever religion that you. Uh, prescribe to uh is it prescribe or prescribe, subscribe? subscribe subscribe whatever doctor prescribes uh subscribe subscribe below <laughs> <laughs> there you go i'm glad you caught it there was your door so uh, the thing is like who, what's to say that that we are are better so than market. anybody else yeah and and i think that is is a conversation that that needs to be had before you go and, and try to do good well what's to say that you're actually doing good and that's why i really appreciate that book uh, in most of it, as far as you question, well, is this actually hurting or are we actually helping these people? And a lot of times if you go and ask these people genuinely, do you appreciate us being here? You know, what is it that we're offering that you appreciate or would you do it differently if you had our resources? And a lot of times they're going to say, well, you know, you come over here and you help us, you make some bricks or you build a building and when you leave, we have to tear it, tear it down and, and build it the right way. And so there's just this extra time. And you come and you pat yourself on the back, oh, look at what we did. But we have to go back behind you and actually fix it. And so there's just, there, there to me is a, a internal dilemma of, well, they want to help. Do you want my help, first off? And if you do, how, how can I help you? How can we collaborate and how can we sit down and, and really get into how can how can we get the whole community involved? And so that was one thing that I saw in Haiti, it kind of piggybacking off of what you're talking about with the, the, the compound that has been there for, for 50, 60 years, is ha- Haiti hasn't changed. In fact, it's probably gotten worse over the last number of years because there is so much kind of corruption. There's all this money coming in, and that's going back to people that don't live in Haiti or, or they're, they're not from Haiti. Um, and so it's, well, it's some of it, some of it, but it's just an interesting, be careful on your sweeping statements <laughs> on the house husband diaries. I don't make sweeping statements at all. Anything I say is general. There's I'm always kidding. exceptions and there, there's statements. always More sweeping statements to come. Sweeping statement, sweeping statement. Here's a round of applause. <laughs> That's a golf clap. Oh. So <laughs> told you I bring entertainment value. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just interesting when you really get into when you're on the ground and you just see there's so much kind of corruption and it's not that you hear about it. It's you're looking at it right in the face. And I mean, funny story when we were going to Boston blue, we had a little bit of free time and our driver was driving us up this crazy mountain. And for whatever reason, the government had decided we're not going to start at the bottom of the mountain. We're going to start at the top of the mountain and pave downwards. And so we're, we'd come to this small little, I don't even really want to call it a village, it's just a small little area, and there's a, a few houses or, or ten, uh, little whatever you want to it's call it. It's a strip them. village. Yeah. 
like uh, a strip mall for so, for a living. So they they had decided to pave just the the uh, the middle yeah, of yeah, this like little village, two hundred yards or something yeah. or whatever and, it was. And so you're you're driving in gravel, gravel, and then it's pavement, 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 nice and smooth, and then back to gravel, and it's like. That was less than a football field. What is going on here? <laughs> it was just like the, the, there wasn't, and again, I say this from living here in the States and being an American and used to a certain kind of logic, and that was just different. And I thought it was really funny, and it, it's one of those, you just question why. And I get that everybody's different. There's a different reason, but it was just interesting and again, I go back to, well, man, I'm not in Kansas right now. Granted, I'm from North Carolina. I use Kansas for those of you who get that joke. Um, but it was just what? so much to, to kind of unpack for this tri- this two-week trip. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking Alice in Wonderland, but it's the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. I know, I know. It's all those, can't <laughs> keep all those women straight. Toto. What was Toto. her name? Dorothy. Dorothy. I know. Dorothy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's so much stuff that correlates from that experience. And I think what I, what I'm thinking as as we near the end of this episode, I think for a little bit here, for me, um, we wanted to have fun and share this, this, our experience of this trip, um, for y'all, but also because we'll get into some other topics that, um, are more near and dear to, to the American situation. And, and we'll probably come back when, when Chase is on and reference sort of what our experience in Haiti. So it's just nice to kind of share at least for, for almost an hour or so, some of our experiences in Haiti. And I'm sure more will come out because there's things like, can we really help, uh, you know, people that we don't live near, but if we don't have an understanding uh, like say in the Black Lives Matter or something like, is it the same thing that you know? Well, we don't know what it's like to grow up in in a in in a black community because we're not black. Then can we really help that? Is there even mm-hmm. it? Is there even really? Uh, are we are we bringing up problems in America that have no answer, and they're just we're just bringing them up to divide? Or what are potential answers for that if we do live here? And so I don't want to get like into those right that that sort of a a a line of thinking right now but we'll just i think there's a lot of experiences because this this sort of division and this lack of of ability to help or helping in in a in an unproductive way which becomes not helping and 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 actually detrimental I, i think those experiences in haiti are very much the same as here in, in America, and then when we ask those difficult questions about s- things in today's politics or in our economics, how can we help here in America? You know, maybe some of the things that we're doing to supposedly help politically or racially or whatever, maybe they're not helping, and we can see that in in international nonprofit work or even other other national uh, nonprofit work in America. But I think that that's kind of was in the back of my mind. I just wanted to pop that out there. I think it's interesting, and this is something I've thought for a while, is it's very, very similar to Haiti. There's not one issue. You go down there and you, sp- you spend just a few few hours in, in any real one area, you're going to see that there's not just one issue. There, There's, I don't want to say infinite, but there are plenty of different issues. And so to to try to throw one solution at it is not going to work. You have to kind of really break down all of the different issues and tackle each of those issues and try to come up with a solution. And I think that's that's kind of what collectively our country has, has been doing is they, for example, you look at the Black Lives Matter movement or, or the Me Too movement or anything, and they say, well, this is what the, the issue is. But when you really start to, to try to get in, into it and understand what, the, what their message is, you start to see that, well, it's not just one issue. So mm-hmm. there can't be one solution. And so you really have to start breaking it down into multiple different pieces and try to come up with the solution for all of those different issues. And I think that is a big sticking point for a lot of this country right now is both on the left and the right, he, and, and I think you mentioned it yesterday, is uh, 
Don't tell them we recorded yesterday. <laughs> if this, <laughs> no, no, yeah. Last episode. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> oh, so much to think about. Fine, I'm done. I'm going home. Yes. Um. So. Uh, well. Uh, that was it for Chase on the House Husband Diaries. Bye, guys. It was, it was yeah. nice to hang out. Yeah, we just wanted to share with you how friendships end. <laughs> Hold on. i got to really end you it. disagree with me? Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, it, it comes down to we really have to come together. And and first off, I have to identify, and identify for myself what what it is that I want and what I'm trying to accomplish. And Which is a massive you're getting ready to move on to the next thing that you have to I'm identify. Dropping it. But at the same time, like, I don't know what I want in life. Sure. All the time. Yeah. Well, nobody you know? can. I mean, sometimes I want a pepperoni pizza and sometimes I don't, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I, you know, so, I mean, what do you want? And so to make, to, to, to make a political statement of, well, this is what I want. And then it's like, well, but do you speak for everyone mm-hmm. in of your gender, everyone of your race? And, and, and the, the answer is no, mm-hmm. because we're all different. We're all unique. And so I think that's what's really hard. And then being able to have, you know, that balance of opinion and say, well, I believe this for this or this for that. And, and then how do we do we listen to nuance or do we have nuance? And where does that come into play anyway? So that knowing what you want, yeah, is the beginning or knowing what people yeah. want that you yeah. That you're trying to help, or could you even help? But knowing the problem. Yeah. You, you have to identify what the problem is, and I think this is a, a, part of the problem of our, our political system is you see these bills that have four, five, ten different different pieces to it. And, on a good day. Uh, well, four or five hundred. Yeah. And, and so all of these bills are being pushed through, and it's well, you either accept all of this or none of it. Yeah, which is... So and that crazy. doesn't make any sense because why are you why are you putting in funds for this with well now we're legalizing weed it just doesn't make any sense and I think we approach that in a lot of regards is well if you think this way well then you therefore must think this and must believe this about that and then no not really yeah so let's let's kind of start to break down things into a number of different pieces so then we can actually start creating solutions yeah. Not solution, but solutions. Yeah. Yeah, but that but then that takes time. And that's not something that we but have. But we're going to live forever. That, that no, that's the point is we don't live forever and so we don't have the time to waste on nuance. We just want to throw a Red one Bull. size one size fits all. <laughs> we solve all the problems and then we move on to creating more problems to solve when we never actually solve band-aids. I used to love band-aids. <laughs> and so my grandparents, when I was probably like six or something, five, I don't know, that my grandparents' dog got me one or two boxes of band-aids, I don't remember, for like a birthday or Christmas present. And I proceeded to open them and put <laughs> a band-aid after band-aid after band-aid after band-aid because I thought it made me look like a man, like I'd been in war and I just had band-aids. <laughs> And then my mom forgot, and we went out to the mall, and she all these people kept looking, going, "What did you? Oh my god, yeah, what did you throw? Yeah, did you throw him down the stairs or something?" And she was like, "Why?" And then she goes, "Oh my god, you're just covered in band aids." I would I would say your poor mom, man. No, well, poor mom. Yeah, it's good times. No, <laughs> sorry. I, I like band aids. Band aids are good. <laughs> now I know what in, to get you for in Christmas. Cer- in certain situations, no. Now I have arm hair and leg hair. I would never do that. that I was... will send Lisa a box of band aids. Lisa, we, we, these are for when yeah, he when he yeah, misbehaves. No, this is this is. Yeah. Send me a send me a, a band aid with with a razor and some shaving cream. Nope. That way I'll no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whew. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, yeah, it's band aids because we have to know what we what we want. So you identify that, and then where you go, did you have like did, did have you have do you have it compartmentalized? Yeah, do you have it in your mind. You know, do you know the whole answer? No, I think that's just the start. I'm oh. not trying to go and spend a whole like other it. hour. I like it. I mean, unless you want to. Mm. I think we'll end, and then we'll we'll, we'll pick it up because I, I think it's a good place to start, kind of. Uh, you know, on this, this idea of, uh, of knowing what we want and the differences. And, and so that gets to the human condition of just, uh, why are we unhappy or unfulfilled and why do we want something? Mm -hmm. And is that something that we want and, and, and does our, does our need 
is our want a need or are we wanting something because we're envious of someone else? So you're saying basically, if I'm hearing you correctly, I've got my vanilla ice cream of one scoop and I'm super excited. And then you come out with a scoop of vanilla and chocolate. And now my vanilla ice cream is worthless. Why is it always got to be white and black? Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate's brown. Are you saying brown lives don't matter? Never said that. Yeah, Why you are you putting words I in my mouth? To- I totally heard that. That's what I Why heard. Why are you putting words? Well, I ice, want ice cream in my mouth, ice not cream, words. Ice cream was just a metaphor for your racism. <laughs> we, Shh. <laughs> we get it. Ice cream matters. Okay, maybe it was mint chocolate chip, which is actually my favorite kind of ice cream. Ooh, green. You like aliens? You, you, do you believe in aliens? I like aliens. Okay. Joe Rogan, did you see his comment? Which there one? Was some, there was something like... Uh, do you see where the yeah. feds have come out and said there's aliens? Ex-Israeli whatever says that I aliens see are that. In, hi- yeah. in hiding. I did see that. And Joe, We're not ready and Joe for Rogan, them. Yeah, and Joe Rogan said, get your shit together. I want to meet these aliens. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Joe Rogan, for your jokes. And I'm sure you were serious, but it's funny. Yeah. So, yeah, so just, uh, yeah, exactly. If, if one person, if you're happy with your scoop of ice cream and you see somebody with two scoop, scoops of ice cream, like, why do you, why, why, why is that? A, a part of the human condition to then now be jealous or envious and want mm-hmm. when you were happy and content and when how do we deal with that in a society as large as as the united states of america 330 million people that's a lot of scoops of ice cream it's a lot of cows that have to make that ice cream yeah. and then some smart asses on youtube are going to say i don't even like ice cream that was a bad analogy well don't sorry watch. unsubscribe I don't really like ice cream a whole lot. Yes, you do. You just said you like mint chocolate chip. Said it's my favorite. And say I eat it every day. Because if I if I get a tub of that, I'm gonna eat the whole tub. So I just don't buy it. Right. <clears throat> so I think we're gonna stick with ice cream as our metaphor for all things racist and um, homophobic and everything. So ice cream is gonna be our word for this. Is that a safe word? Year. Or unsafe word. Unsafe word. Yeah. Well, it depends on what side. It depends on what side. (laughs) That's true. Depends on what kind of ice cream it is. Ooh. What's your favorite kind of ice cream? Why you got to ask such deep, difficult questions? That is something that you should just spit off. Ooh, I know. I know. You're right. I know. Uh, If you've ever been to Boston, there's an ice cream... uh, chain called jp licks yeah and (laughs) l-i-x no l-i-c-k-s okay i'm just questioning don't x me again (laughs) so (laughs) (laughs) anyway it's salted salted caramel oreo or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it is delicious. It's good stuff. Oh, huh? man. It's so good. It's my favorite. It's my favorite ice cream. Thanks. Thanks for asking me. I, was, like, I always think about cookie dough and Ben and Jerry's and, you know, whatever. The regular old Rocky Road, mint chocolate chip. And I'm always like, ah, I, I, I like a lot of it. I have a sweet tooth. But then mm-hmm. when we lived in Boston a year and a half ago, two years ago, I was like. Found the Holy Grail oh, ice cream. I was like, oh, this is the only thing I like about living that far north. One is of, the cold. One of the only things. Yeah, I can eat ice cream in the freezing winter. It's great. I can eat ice cream outside yeah. and it doesn't melt. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I can't taste the ice cream anymore. It just tastes <laughs> frozen. <laughs> oh, my food is stuck. Uh, all right, so we'll pick up with the human condition after this. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the House Husband Diaries. Again. Thanks, y'all. My buddy Chase. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Have a good day.